All right. So uh, just a couple of things I wanted to start with. Um, first of all, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, it is 2021. Yay. Yay. If we it was made a little, it. For me, if it was a little later in the day, maybe I'd, I'd toast, but kind of early for that for me. <laughs> oh, Brian's got the toast mug, though, I see. There we go. Yes. Cheers. Here's the 2021. Uh, just Amen. a couple of things to, to note, uh, just to look back here. Um, so, um, so today I'm just going to, here's our review, just review 2020 a little bit. Then we'll have uh, Larry's presentation, the discussion, which may or may not be in that order. Maybe we'll blend them together. Who knows? All yeah. right. <laughs> um, so a couple of things here, just uh, to note. <laughs> so 2020 wasn't all that bad for, for some things, okay? As, as, even though the world kind of ended. Uh, we did form five miles from anywhere this year. Uh, we became an official science society of the BSI, uh, and we connected to Sherlockians all over the world, which I think is pretty impressive, uh, especially with such a crazy year. So just wanted to point that out. Um, and just a couple of things that we did. Uh, so here were our meetings in 2020 that we started with Chris Chan, who did a scandal. Uh, Thomas Burns did The Witch of LNB, and he's going to do another uh, story uh, in 2021. Uh, Robert Parrott did A Case of Juris Imprudence. I did uh, Ray Eight Squires. Jay did Dying Detective. Uh, Tom did A Ghost from Christmas Past. And last uh, month, for its 100th anniversary, we had artist Karen Goslin for Unique Hamlet. Um, and I think we've done a nice job of kind of going back and forth between canon and pastiche. Um, and today's kind of miscellaneous. Uh, we'll see where we decide. But I just thought that was kind of cool that we've done. Uh, we've had a pretty successful uh, year. And uh, I think we'll just keep going with this. Uh, and we're already booked for speakers uh, through April. So uh, very cool. And I'll talk a little more about that at the end of today's session. Um, so um, today, Larry Feldman is going to be- All right, I'll start with the Apocrypha. All right. Yeah. I'll start with the Apocrypha. I'll start the Apocrypha. There we go. Uh, so uh, Larry is going to give our talk uh, today. I'm going to stop sharing for a second here, because that's all I really had for the uh, slideshow for today. Uh, so Larry is a retired educator, lives in Denver, Colorado, and is the staff surgeon of Dr. Watson's Neglected Patients, which is our Denver area scion society of the BSI. Uh, Larry runs a separate group uh, that's an offshoot known as the Outpatients. And we meet once a month on the first Sunday of the month at Pints Pub, lately it's been virtually because of the pandemic. Uh, but we discuss a story from the canon. We have a, a quiz on it and we, uh, drink and eat and have a really great time. Um, so, uh, Larry, I will turn the reins. That was a kind of a brief intro, but I'll, I'll turn the reins over to you and let us know uh, how you'd like to go from here on out. All right. Well, I, I, first thing is I, I, I'd ask you all, I'm going to show you books. Okay. I'm going to, I'll and, set the view for you, the speaker view. Okay. Yeah. yeah do, I, I, so I would say everybody really in there should set to speaker view. So when I hold up a book, it won't be the size of a postage stamp, hopefully, uh, and you'll be able to see what uh, what I'm doing there. I did see. I did. I, I put mine on speaker view. Let's see. But I'm still just seeing you. I've got you on right. speaker view as well, Larry. So the recording is showing the speaker view. So if anyone is just seeing the small version okay. of you, they can go back and watch the recording and see the big version okay. of you. Okay. Okay. All right. So you're seeing the big version of me. I am. I'm, not, I'm seeing the big version of you, Derek, so it's confusing. <laughs> okay. I, I, believe, I believe you, though. All right. Uh, if you say you see me, I, Wait, you know, I... Here's what I can do. Larry, give me a sec. I can mute everybody beside you if you want to give a talk, and then you would be the only one we'd, you'd see on your screen. Well, don't mute everybody. Okay. I, that's okay. I, like, I like to hear from people. Okay. Uh, that works. Uh, the, uh, okay. So, the, 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 obviously, Derek wants me to talk about the Apocrypha, which is fine with me because I... I do, I have spent some time, and this is a story that is considered by, me, by most to be part of the Apocrypha. Uh, and uh, what is the Apocrypha? The Apocrypha is the, are the Sherlock Holmes stories. Now, the Apocrypha are the stories, first of all, that are not in the canon. 
Now, so first you have to define what are the, what's the canon. The Sherlock Holmes canon are, are the 56 short stories and the four long stories um, th that uh, usually are attributed to Watson and or Doyle in, in some way. Uh, they, uh, when I was a kid, and, well, when I first started getting into Sherlock Holmes and all the way back in the, the 1970s as a young man, uh, in, in the United States, this was the, the complete Sherlock Holmes um, by Doubleday. This was considered, this was like our apocrypha. I mean, this was, I'm sorry, this was like our canon. This is what we used to do to refer to this. In those days, every, Sherlock Holmes was still under copyright. And so you really had to have permission to publish it and then collect money for Sherlock Holmes legally, at least in the United States. And so you, you, this is where everybody got it. And it was so regular that people would say, oh, I got that from Doubleday page 847. And everybody would know what, everybody would have a common reference to look it up. Now, I realize I'm talking to an international group here. So um, to the international group, I will say this was the canon of those days. It's these two books, which are, um, are the Murray editions. Uh, one book dedicated to the short stories and one book to the long stories. So if you were on, on your side of the Atlantic, uh, this was the Sherlock Holmes canon, but they were the same 60 stories and no more, no less. And so when we started discussing the canon, what, what is Sherlock Holmes canon and what isn't, uh, this, these books, Complete Sherlock Holmes and, the, uh, and, and, and Murray's uh, the Complete Short Stories and Long Stories or the canon, the 60. And uh, however, once we finished reading all those stories, there were some people who felt that there were other stories out there that were, uh, that they were, it would make, that would have made the canon even more complete. That, that the complete wasn't really complete. There was, there was more to it. Hey, Ron, glad you enjoyed it. Hey, Lorraine. And uh, anyway, I was just talking, telling them about the Apocrypha. So uh, the, uh, the thing is that uh, in 1980, Jack Tracy, who is a guy who uh, invented, the guy who wrote the Sherlock, most people know him from the uh, Encyclopedia Sherlockiana, Jack Tracy, but he wrote a book called, he put out a book, I should say, or edited a book called Sherlock Holmes, The Published Apocrypha. And uh, in it, he included a lot of the stories that you know we'll 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 mention a little bit, and uh, then after that, a few years later, uh, actually about a year later, uh, Peter Haining, who's best known for the Sherlock Holmes scrapbook, also published a book called *The Final Adventures of Sherlock Holmes*, which also uh, I can you know I had that in my apocrypha section of my collection. Let's put it that way. And the third real basic apocrypha book came from Richard Lancelin Green, the uh, most, one of the most obsessed and knowledgeable of all Sherlockians in the history of Sherlockiana. And uh, he wrote, he published this book called The Uncollected Sherlock Holmes through Penguin. And uh, all of those, and all those are the books I look to when I, when I think about the apocrypha. Um, of course, now, very recently, another one was added to it which uh, I, I so surely recommend was The Apocrypha of Sherlock Holmes by Leslie Klinger, which is an annotated version of what he considers to be the Apocrypha. Now, the thing about these three Apocrypha books, four Apocrypha books, is they don't all contain the exact same stories. Uh, unlike the canon, which is locked into 60 stories, the Apocrypha is more of a matter of opinion uh, in terms of, uh, of, of Sherlock Holmes. They're not they're not the pastiches that we that we see everywhere. That we, we say those are not the apocrypha. But to be in the apocrypha, what do you what do you need to have? Uh, what does a story? What qualities does a story need to have to be an apocrypha? Well, I'll tell you what the qualities are, and then I will tell you about the exceptions uh, to to the rules, uh, because the apocrypha is actually that loose that even the rules for the apocrypha don't always apply. Um, the the the. the um, the stories that you would consider to be of more the most complete of the complete Sherlock Holmes that you should keep reading even after you're done with the 60. And usually there are stories that are generated somehow by Doyle, 
uh, whether you whether it was as, li as a literary agent or an editor or the author, you know, that's up to you. But it was in some way generated by Doyle, and in another and it has something to do with Sherlock Holmes. It has a Sherlock Holmes in it himself? Has a character in it? Um, anything like that would then would then be considered uh, part of the the apocrypha. So what does the apocrypha contain? Well, it contains um, several things that are pretty universal. Uh, one is it contains uh, how uh, the field bazaar, which is a very, very short little little vignette that, that Doyle wrote for his alma mater to help them raise money. It's about a page and a half. And it, all, and it also, well, about three pages, I guess. And the other one was how Watson learned the trick, which was part of the, which, was, which literally is a page and a half for, for a very good reason, it's that short because it was part of the, the, uh, the Queen's dollhouse. It was a big project in those days uh, where they were going to build a 20th century home exactly to scale uh, for the Queen in the form of a dollhouse. And, they, and there was gonna be no, and there was no expense to be spared. And they wanted to be so realistic that they went and they got uh, the, the uh, most famous painters, artists of, in, in England. And those artists drew an original, did an original painting just for the dollhouse. Now they had to make it the size of a, of a, uh, of a postage stamp. So it would go into the dollhouse, but those artists did it. They took a little brush and they took a little postage stamp. Those were the days when you can just miniaturize things on a, on, on a, on a, on a copy machine. You had to really, they had to do it originally that way. And, uh, and that's what they did. And then they got the, the original, and then they said, well, what about the library? And so then they went and they got the authors, uh, the famous authors of the time. And they said, could you just write a little, we're gonna send you a little tiny book and we want you to write in a little tiny book, a story, an original story. And uh, then that will be part of the, of, of the Queen Anne Library. And so Doyle wrote the story, How Watson Learned a Trick. And uh, it's very short, page and a half, has Sherlock Holmes and Watson again uh, in, 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 in uh, doing their talk, their back and forth talk. So it's, it was pretty, so it, it, you know, it's a pretty special little thing. And in the story, the, the joke of the story is that Holmes, Watson uh, is, is trying to show Holmes that he knows how to do the deduction thing and does a bunch of deductions about Holmes. And he sounds just like Holmes when he does it. And, uh, and the, but the conclusions he comes to, of course, were all completely wrong. And you're gonna see that that actually, that's a precedent that actually will enter into the discussion of who were the, who was the um, gifted, gifted reasoner, as I think they put it. How do they put it for that story? For the, the law special, he was called, let's see, not the gifted reasoner, he was called a, uh, Celebrated reasoner, well known, uh, an amateur reader, an amateur reasoner of some celebrity, whoever that person was uh, who did it in the story, and so, um, but that relates to it. And there were a lot of other things that were in the apocrypha, of course. Uh, or again, most all of them, one of one one of them is there are some except one of them is is the um, I think should which always should be in it. Uh, is Gillette's Sherlock Holmes play. Uh, when that originally came out, it was said by Arthur Conan Doyle and William Gillette. Though uh, Gillette, you know, just sort of stole ideas from Doyle's stories and based them and, and, and made his own. Uh, he, I, don't think, I don't think Doyle actually really helped him much. He did it with Doyle's permission, however. And uh, so, uh, but, that's, but that story has it's such an effect on the way people viewed Sherlock Holmes and so important that really, if you're a Sherlockian scholar, well, you should at least see or read William Gillette's play uh, at least once to really have experienced the complete Sherlock Holmes. Um, yeah, and you know, and there are very other things. There's, there's actually another, another. Uh, some people put in uh, include prefaces to Sherlock to, that Doyle wrote to Sherlock Holmes collections which were not in the canon. There's only one preface in the canon and that's the one before his last bow. Uh, that, and, and so that's part of the canon, I guess. But 
the other all the other preferences, or if, or if, or, if, or if Doyle did a speech about Sherlock Holmes and that speech got written out, then that perhaps is part of the apocrypha as well. It's generated by Doyle and has to do with Sherlock Holmes. Um, another uh, one of the interesting exceptions is uh, once Doyle and, and James Barry, the, the author of Peter Pan, once did a uh, libretta of a of, of some kind of uh, uh, some kind of opera, and uh, they they did it to, you know, they did it together, and they were very proud of it, and it went on, and it was a total flop, it was a terrible terrible failure, and so the two of them were neither of them had ever had such a big flop before, so it was like a big a new experience for them, and eventually they were laughing about it, and uh, so Barry wrote of Sherlock Holmes, a little, a little parody of Sherlock Holmes that kind of makes fun of how bad the play was and how, and how, well, how big a failure it was to both authors. And Doyle liked this, this parody so much that he actually included it in his autobiography. And so because it is in a book published by, uh, it is in a book, that was written by Arthur Conan Doyle, although it, the, the, the parody itself was not written by Arthur Conan Doyle. Some, some consider that part of the apocrypha as well. Um, so, and, we, and of course that brings us to uh, the two stories from, uh, uh, how did you put it again? From the, the, uh, the, 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 round, the round the lamp discussions. Uh, that Doyle did a series of it. So he also included it in a, in a, in a book called uh, Terra's, here's, here's, here's a version of it, uh, Tales of Terra and Mystery. I think that's where Derek got his PDF from because uh, it, said, it said so attached to it. Um, you know, he includes those stories in here, uh, uh, the, a book by, of, of Doyle's stories, and he also included it in the lamp stories, the Tales Around the Lamp stories. And uh, in, the, in the story, um, in both of the stories, one is called The, the, the Tale of the, the Adventure of the Man with the Watches, uh, what book am I holding up? I'm holding up a, uh, this, I know it's a little hard to read, but basically it's down here, it says in green, The Tales of Terror and Mystery by Arthur, and up here it says Arthur Conan Doyle. So I guess it's a kind of, a, it's, it's a little hard to see because of the green on the, uh, the, the, the coloring of it. But if you look at the letter that, that Derek sent you, you'll see attached to the PDF, it says Tales of Terror and Mystery PDF. Uh, is, is where he got the uh, the, the lost his, his his the lost special story that he sent around for us uh, to read. So um, it, so Doyle included those stories in there, and uh, you know one of the things I object you know you, in, also in Derek's letter while we're on the subject he he had a quote from from a wiki about uh, where it said that um, the lost special was implied to be a uh, Sherlock Holmes story. I don't think it's implied to be. I think it's inferred to be because we, we're the ones that we don't know what, who, the, what the author implied what meant to imply but we know that we can infer as Sherlock Holmes inferred because a, a deduction is an inference and you know that's what Sherlock Holmes did we using Holmes's methods um, inferred that uh, that that was the case okay so yeah the round of fire stories that's the, that's the one uh, so um, as, thank you, Shanna. Uh, anyway, uh, the so these two stories are also thought to be. Uh, Christopher Morley was the first one to put out that he thinks that these are two suppressed Sherlock Holmes stories and really should be part of a complete Sherlock Holmes. Um, then uh, who else did? Uh, let's see. But I made a note here. Uh, Let's see. I think I think Smith did the same thing um, in, 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 in one of his things, in one of his collections. And so, oh, and that, another thing, one of the reasons why it says the published apocrypha in this Jack Tracy book is because he was Jack Tracy was aware of another thing that he thought should be in the apocrypha, but he did not have permission to to uh, to print, and that was the story called uh, The Angels of Darkness, the, the, the play that um, you know, our friend, our member here, who is here with us today, Turley, Tom Turley, 
actually use that as a, as a, as a reference in, in his in the short story we studied of his, um, because uh, you know the uh, which was what let's see. No, I'm so well organized until until the until the talk starts. Um, anyway, in ter in Turley's story, what was it, the Christmas special or something? The Christmas anniversary. Ghost of Christmas past. Christmas past. That's it. So Tom, right? So Tom actually did, you know, got the idea of or, or employed the idea of Watson's living in San in San Francisco and Sherlock Holmes and Doyle did do a play. Uh, that's considered part of the apocrypha. It wasn't available then, but it was available in time. So, he, so Klinger could put it in his book. And uh, basically it was a, a story took place in San Francisco. It seemed to have a lot of elements in it from um, the Mormon story, a study in Scarlet. And it had, uh, and it had a, 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 a person, a, a character in it called Dr. John Watson. Um, and th this story actually did, I used to think that it probably preceded a study in Scarlet and that he took things out of it for a study in Scarlet. That's actually not the case. The truth is he actually wrote that play after the sign of the four. So he wrote it before. So he's, he actually took, he actually took idea that of a study in Scarlet to use in the play. And, uh, but of course that was before Sherlock Holmes was a household name. Holmes wasn't a household name until he started writing for the Strand, the short stories. So in those days, a study in Scarlet and the sign of the four were a very small deal in literature uh, up until that point. And so I guess he felt, you know, if he took ideas from, from a study in Scarlet, who read that anyway? And uh, he would, you know, he, would, he, he could get away with it then, but he didn't realize what was coming when he started doing the short stories. So anyway, um, these are all things of the Apocrypha. And the question before us is, do, does it do this? Does the story, the law special, uh, is, is should that be included in uh, in the apocrypha? And most apocrypha groupings do include it, but not all. And uh, so, you know, what did you think? So the, the thing I want to open up now is 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 to the group. And hey, so Blair, tell me what what did, what did you think? Hey, Larry, Larry, I I just want to uh, thank you. Uh, but I want to interrupt you for a second because I have a question for the group because this, this is kind of a legend of the canon. And I want to know if anybody uh, can, it's kind of become like a, an urban legend in a sense that in France, there are editions of the canon that are 62 stories and that right. the canon in France includes the man with watches and the lost special. Now, I've contacted Sherlockians in France. I've contacted the Facebook Sherlock Holmes Society of France. Uh, I've even asked in the Strangers Room group on Facebook, has anyone actually seen an edition that includes those two stories? And no one has told me that they have. But yet I see, uh, in, in, especially in the book, Sherlock Holmes and Philosophy, a couple of, I believe it's more than one piece in there, references the 60s two story canon of France to argue what is the canon. Um, but I almost think that it's a fake thing. I don't, I don't know what, well, I was just wondering if you have a copy of it or if anybody has actually seen a French copy of the canon that has uh, 62 stories. Well, I've never seen a French copy, but I have seen um, Sherlock Holmes uh, books, the, the ones, the collections that are, are um, that do include those two stories, or, or that also will include the, uh, the how Watson learned the trick as well. Uh, and and uh, usually I, I, I've, I don't own one though, because I've only seen them in, um, in um, what are they called, the digital books? Oh, ebooks. The Kindle, right. Yeah. I've only seen it in, e yeah. right. in Kindle format. Uh, there have been Sherlock Holmes collections that did include uh, things beyond, beyond the canon, beyond the 60 stories. Well, well, Derek, Derek and Larry, what's interesting is if you go to the Arthur Conan Doyle encyclopedia and go to Sherlock Holmes, they actually say there are officially 62 stories and they do list the Field Bazaar and how Watson learned the trick as two official Sherlock Holmes stories. All right, so, that's interesting. You said okay, that's in, I didn't know that. Steve? I'm sorry? What, what, what book was that in? 
But well, it's the website, the Arthur Conan Doyle Encyclopedia. That's got you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's good to know. We'll have to research that. That would that would be, that would be an interesting thing to know about. Um, okay. But uh, with all that done and all that said, um, what did you think now of the of the uh, of the of the Tale of the Lost special? Did you think that that was a, that should include be a, a part of a complete Sherlock Holmes? Do you think the reasoner within it was Sherlock Holmes, and why? What reasons can you give to assert that, or to assert that it wasn't him? Um, so first, of all, I'll I'll take volunteers. What you, you and you know you can just talk about what you think about the story in general as stories go. Uh, it, 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 I I always found it a little difficult to get my head around it completely. But today, I, I but I, when I read it for this meeting, or read it this week, I, I I did get it. I think pretty strongly. It's all about a guy named Herbert Dillernock. Herbert Dillernock, who's a master criminal and who's confessed to a crime uh, years later after it took place that nobody could ever solve in all of the nine years leading up until his confession. Um, so what did you think of the story? And, and feel free to unmute yourself uh, to yeah. respond. And if, uh, you know, start to have a couple people like unmuting or, or if people want to put in the chat, I can organize the discussion here. Um, but please feel free at first to just jump in with your thoughts on the story. Okay, I'm going to gallery view so I can see you all at the same size. <laughs> well, I guess I would start by the question I would have is that this was published in the Strand in 1898, which was obviously right still in the height of Sherlock Holmes popularity. Why would Doyle not make it a Sherlock Holmes story? I mean, would he would that have sold more strands, or if he had, you know, definitely identified it as a Sherlock Holmes story or not? Hmm. Well, where did it come in the order of the canon? In other words, when he wrote it, in eight was it eighteen ninety eight that he actually wrote it? Uh, and well, it, was, it was published in it was published in August of eighteen ninety eight. Okay, so. Um, at that point, uh, was the Return of Sherlock Holmes published yet? Was did it, was Holmes still thought to be dead? Perhaps you know that could be one reason why he might want to hide Sherlock Holmes's identity. It would have been it would have been in between the the final problem and the uh, the return. So you're right. right. So yeah. So in those days, you know, he he was he he'd sworn off Sherlock Holmes at that point. So that's just that's a guess. Right. But, uh, you know, in those days, were, so it, in fact, uh, the, the uh, first story that he wrote, the, the, one, um, the one with the man with the watches, <laughs> the, the expert comments, and that's, that's supposed to be 1892. Now, in 1892, Sherlock Holmes was in Tibet, according to uh, the way we trace Sherlock Holmes' life. And I think one writer said that he learned transcendental meditation and was able to project his consciousness uh, uh, to ask to ask Michael to write it up for him or something like that. But uh, it, it seems it seems hard to understand. It seems hard to imagine Sherlock Holmes in Tibet following um, mysteries in, in London. But maybe, you know. Now this story supposedly takes place, if I recall, was it June of eighteen nine? So it takes at least when when the special disappears. So. That would be before the hiatus, um, right. and it would also be before the death of Moriarty, which I'd also think if Holmes mm -hmm. was involved in this, perhaps Moriarty was behind the whole thing. Um, okay. Something to consider, but well, and, Derek, and why what, the guy might feel safe coming forward after all those years because he knows he doesn't have to deal with Moriarty. Um, but right. I, I think one question would be if it was 1890 and Holmes was still alive and uh, very much famous at that point. Why wouldn't they use his name uh, to say, "Hey, Sherlock Holmes wrote, and here's his theory"? Um, that would be a That's question. The man who has watches that applies to, mm -hmm. yeah, not really a lost special, but the man who has the man with the watches, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. That was a little bit earlier. Um, so yeah, I, again, so that's why I say it, it, it's implied. It's 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 a difference between implied and inferred. I don't think Doyle was trying. To, I don't think Doyle was trying to imply. That this was Sherlock Holmes, but I think that we can infer, perhaps, that it was. Um, uh, so there's a lot of arguments back and forth about it. The first is, uh, I think, also in the um, the band with watches, he talks about guessing. 
a little bit. You have to use that word. And they say Holmes would never would never guess. And uh, one, of, one, of, one of the great arguments against it being Sherlock Holmes is that, the, is that he was wrong. And Sherlock, <laughs> Holmes, Sherlock Holmes would have been right. So it couldn't have been Sherlock Holmes because it was, it was clearly wrong. Norbury. <laughs> yeah. So, so what I, else? You know, you know I want to go back to that, him being wrong. I, I, I know that that's brought up a lot, but if you think about it, the way it was worded, he was just saying, look, here's, here's a theory based on what I know so far, and even though it's improbable, you should investigate this. He doesn't say that it's necessarily the absolute correct right. solution. He just says, this is where I would have you guys uh, investigate it. So I, I do want to yeah. give a little bit of credit to the, the – uh, amateur reasoner of some celebrity here that I, I don't think he was uh, wrong and that they should have looked into that. Well, but the thing is, is that, you know, in, in the lost special, he really, you know, he really shows by bringing up um, the Holmes's maxim or his, um, um, his, uh, uh, well, his, his saying, let's say uh, the, the, uh, that uh, you know, whatever you eliminate the impossible, whatever is left must be the truth. Um, he said exactly what he said was, it is one of the elementary principles of practical reasoning, he remarked, that when the impossible has been eliminated, the residium, however improbable, must contain the truth. Now, the, and really, the, the story really shows the limits of that because the trick is hmm. determining what's impossible and what's improbable and the difference between the two. And that's really what happened is that he didn't think it was possible to run that train uh, in that particular lot because there were no tracks. And obviously it's impossible to run a train on the dirt, but perhaps but it, was, it turned out that it was possible that somebody put in some, some, tra from some, some, uh, some mm -hmm. tracks for temporarily. So it could go that one, that one day it could run and then take them up again and then, and then remove them again so nobody could find them. Uh, so, there's so you know so so there's that but and and and, that, and it certainly is interesting uh about it um so what what, did, what does anybody else think my notion was he couldn't he conan doyle could figure out a way for the the puzzle to be solved so he had this guy can had to explain it and so it, it, i mean in terms of a mystery story it's that it's not really you can't solve the mystery, so the, you know you have to have the confession to explain the whole thing. So it's it's kind of odd in that way, and I don't know that Sherlock Holmes. He could, maybe he couldn't figure out a way for Sherlock Holmes to solve it that made that was acceptable, and he just. Mm -hmm. Well, nine years went by, and no one had yeah. solved it. Yeah. So that's, this was nine years between the, the the crime and the confession, so you know I don't know. Uh, may, maybe that was why he suppressed it with Sherlock Holmes. Because he was wrong, and didn't want to, to uh, didn't want to admit that Sherlock Holmes got something wrong, though right. uh, he, he does admit that in the canon several times. Of course, he does show, give us examples of Sherlock Holmes being wrong about things. Um, okay, let's see. So, I'm Tom. Well, Larry, Larry, can I also, oh, also, also mention there's a audio version of of uh, dramatization by Orson Welles, and I think it's called. Um, suspense theater that he did must have done back in the I don't know, 40s maybe where mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a nice drum, dramatization of the story yeah and and there was one uh, that that that's easy it was easily found if you googled it and derek had mentioned it in the letter uh which i did listen to while walking my dog and uh, <laughs> well, well that was well, it was it was pretty fun yeah and, yeah uh, anna yeah. had sent a really great version from uh, YouTube. That was a very well uh, produced. Yeah, that was the one that I listened to. I thought that was, I listened to it as well, Anna. So thank you for sending that link out. That was a very good uh, yeah. version as well. Um, there's a number of, of actually pretty good audio versions. Um, I, I just want to jump in too and say what one argument you can make, it depends on if you want to, <laughs> that this could be a Sherlock Holmes story is that a Solar Ponds has a version of it. Um, and um, <laughs> Yeah, there is the, the Solar Pond story um, is actually called The Adventure of the Lost Locomotive. Uh, and, and as you guys might know, if you read Solar Ponds, every collection had at least one of the untold stories from the, uh, that's mentioned in the canon. Okay, like this one also has 
Uh, right. The Return of the Memoirs of Solar Ponds also has uh, Riccoletti of the Club Foot is one of the stories in there too. Right. Um, and, and so if, if you want to play that game, which is kind of going uh, out, way outside the canon, um, you oh. could say, well, maybe <laughs> this is also a case for why we could include it. Um, but the Ponds one has a very different ending uh, to the story and uh, all is, is well and good in the end. Well, <laughs> no, we, we do know that Ponds is, is parody. So, so we, or, or uh, not, or uh, pastiche. Pastiche. And pastiche so, parody or somewhere in the middle. <laughs> so nobody is saying that pastiche should be a part of the canon. But, uh, but, but, but if it was generated by Doyle and it had something that sounded like Sherlock Holmes. Now, the other thing about this story, which is what Derek was saying before, is that there's a lot of, a lot of things in here that you can infer Moriarty from. Uh, because yes. Monsieur de Lac, Monsieur de Lernac had a friend, had an ally, an English ally, and he who he called one of the one of the acutest brains in England. And mm -hmm. that, that sounds suspiciously like uh, Moriarty. Mm -hmm. uh, my English, he says, my English ally was worthy of such an alliance. He knew London and the West Coast live uh, uh, and the West Coast line thoroughly. And he, com and he had the command of a, of a band of workers who were trustworthy and intelligent. So it was really, it was more, so in that case, it'd be Moriarty's people that actually went in and put down the tracks and then removed the tracks uh, the same day, put them in and removed them uh, before, put them in before the, the, the crime, before the guy, before they, they crashed the train and then removed them afterwards so nobody could find them. And uh, somehow it seems, it seems a lot more likely uh, well, you know, when you put Moriarty, it seems almost more, it seems more possible somehow uh, uh, that it might have happened. I, I thought that too, that the physical description of the character didn't really fit Professor Moriarty, but he was described as a military looking type. And I thought possibly Moriarty's brother, you know. Who, well, that's right, Colonel Moriarty. That's true, uh, yeah. I was thinking that too, because of the train connection, because weren't there like three Moriarty brothers and one of them, Watson mentions, is somehow connected to the railroads? Yeah, that's right. One was a. Uh, what, do you do you remember what it was exactly? Uh, I do remember. No. He was. He was a sta He was the station. Sta he was supposedly a station master, but that's there right. are some people that think that station the master. second brother, who was Colonel Moriarty, is the same guy that after he left the military, he became the station master. So, but yeah. Well, I always liked the legend that 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 Mrs. Moriarty had three children and she named them all James. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which, which makes sense because you know the curtain is mm. like James Moriarty mentioned, and then and then Moriarty's James. And the truth is, is that uh, you know James is just one of those names, James and John, that that mm -hmm. just that Doyle just likes to use on, as sort of a reflex. I remember I was trying to remember the name of of the superintendent of the West of the West Coast Central Station in Liverpool, who's a, who's a big character in the story. And uh, his name was Bland, but what was his first name? Well, of course, it was James. So it's Mr. Mr. James Bland. Mr. Bland, James Bland, was the. Uh, <laughs> that's how I remember it now. Was was the superintendent of uh, of the Liberal Lines, and, and I like and Mr. Potter Hood, the traffic manager. Um, I mean, I, I look at it. If George Foreman can name all of his kids George, then I guess yeah, even the girls <laughs> name all their kids James. You know. Yeah, that, that's perfectly. Uh, that, that seems it seems as logical as anything. Um, I, I also would wonder, you know, does the guy get away with it at the end? Right, he's on death row when he makes the. He's like, if if I make this confession, I'll make this if you guys let me go. <laughs> you know, you yeah, never well, hear. Did they actually agree to this? Does he die? You know that. Well, that was yeah, perfect. we don't know, right? Well, well, well he was. In, yeah, he was engineering that one of his one of those well placed Frenchmen. Would somehow get him off the hook. Or, or, Orson, well, Orson Welles lines for that one. Uh huh. Okay. Hmm. But uh, what was the, what was the answer, Rick, in his version? Uh, uh, the guy gets shot <laughs> by somebody. <laughs> so he doesn't make it out. All this right. Is, well, this is go. about to name the names. Boom. Yeah, yeah I, I see. <laughs> All right. He he was being tried for something other than this crime. Right. Was he not? And he just thought he'd throw this one in because he thought he did such a spectacular job and nobody knew about it. 
Right, so, right. And, and he thought he had such great information that, hey, if you, I reveal this, you guys can, can pardon me and I can walk, you know. He was yeah. trying to pull a, like a lighthouse in the cormorant there. He's like, I, I withheld some of the papers. I can name names. Get me right. out of here. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Trade, trade information. Uh, yeah. He, uh, what, what did he do? He, he murdered, he murdered somebody. It was somebody he was, he was about to be hung for murder of somebody different. And he was just hoping that somebody else would, with power would come in and save him. Um, so we've got Holmes. We've got what sounds like Holmes in there. My personal theory of, of all the, of all the theories about this, I think the one that makes the sense to me is that it was Watson who wrote the letter because Watson had two, had two characteristics that were very important. Number one is he could sound like Sherlock Holmes because that's what he did for a living. He wrote Sherlock Holmes talk, saying, saying things. That's one of the way, that's how he became an author. And the other thing was then he would also get the wrong conclusion, just like he did in <laughs> How Watson Learned the Trick. Exactly like he did in John Watson learned the trick. He sounded just like Holmes, but then came out with the with the with the answer. So, so it really belongs in the John Watson apocrypha. Well, yeah, well, but if if, if if it has John Watson in it, that should be in the canon, maybe just because of John. And that's why we that's why we put uh, the the uh, the play in the canon because John Watson is in it. Um, so, um, in in the apocrypha, rather, not in the play. I've, I've also heard the theory that it was Lestrade that he wrote the letter, um, which, which I can also see that making sense too. I like the Watson idea though. That's part, well, you know, I'm sure after all these years, Lestrade must have Holmes's voice in his brain. <laughs> he must hear it at night when he's, you know, when he's trying to go to sleep I and mean, the poor guy. Uh, so, so yeah, I would, I would say it could, have been, it could have been Lestrade as well. But we also know that Watson, if you, if you read The Adventure of the Empty House, Watson was doing that. He was trying to apply Sherlock Holmes's methods to solve cases on his own. And he was, he was trying to solve um, the, you know, the empty house mystery uh, when, when, uh, when, when Holmes sort of showed up and solved it for him. Um, so anyway, so that, that, that's, that's interesting. So really most of, most of the scholarship uh, is is related related to these two stories is on those is on the is on those two questions. One, could these could these experts be Sherlock Holmes, and if not him, then who? And uh, and the other part was, uh, I guess they, he, there's a lot of research on the timetables of the of the train and how long the train took and things like that. But uh, really, really the whole the mo most of the scholarship is about uh, is about that. So. Should, should you, if one reads the complete Sherlock Holmes, should one read these two stories as well? I, yes. I would say no. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I don't. I don't necessarily buy that. Even that, you know. I think it's just fun, um, and I think we could even talk a bit about the story because I think it's actually a really good story. You know, on its own. You know, and, and I think in a sense it maybe might be a little unfortunate that we spend a lot of time debating whether or not it was a home story, just because I think it was a story on its own. And, and Doyle has some, some very, very good stories um, that are not Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, Horror of the Heights is probably one of my all time favorite stories. Okay. Um, hmm. You know, the, the one with the mummy there a uh, lot. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking. Right. Well, yeah. well, um, well in, tales in, terror, in Tales of Terror and Mystery, he least he doesn't lease them with the terror. He puts them with the mystery stories. These two, mm -hmm. uh, so that's why they didn't make it. They didn't make it into your collection, Derek. Mm -hmm. Derek, you wrote a collection of terror. Correct. Correct. It, does, it wasn't terror. in my horror collection but, of right. Doyle's work, but it wouldn't fit in that particular right. collection. Right. But you know, yeah. But beyond <laughs> it, I I think the story is actually a pretty fun story. I I think it's a it's very clever. Uh, I think the ending is really a great ending. Um, it's fun. And, and I think Doyle did a nice job with it. So I think on its uh, own merits, um, I think it's an excellent story, even if I would not consider it to be a Sherlock Holmes story. That's-, that's I, I've heard from people, however, <clears throat> Ron, for example, I've heard from people that don't think that it makes any sense at all that, that, uh, they could, that he could put down tracks and then pick the tracks up so there'd be absolutely no trace of, of anybody 
uh, anybody, anybody, any, any sign at all that they've done that uh, and why per someone wouldn't open up the mine and look in, just look into it to see if maybe the train was there. Uh, we, but that kind of reminds me of the Musgrave ritual. You know, the Musgrave ritual had this big complicated um, 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 ritual that revealed where the treasure was, but all they really had to do was say it was in the basement. <laughs> That's where, you know, remember, I mean, I, I just, it was in the basement. nobody ever thought to look in the basement for, for anything. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, they had a whole big complicated ritual. So it reminds me of Doyle in some ways, uh, uh, it, you know, in that sense. But, but I do like that, that it really does parts the problem with the, the, the maxim, uh, that the difference between what's impossible and what's improbable. He wasn't wrong. It is impossible for the train to go over stuff where there's no track, but it doesn't actually mean that there was there wasn't track there that day. I mean, that was that was that wasn't considered. So it was a, it was a clever mystery in that way. Uh, again, whether whether you think it's plausible that that he could they could put down the track and then pick up the track, and then also and also there was a switch that could switch the train to the, to this other track. Do they they build that too, or is that left over from the from from the original line? You know, there's a lot of little things about it that that makes it a little a little hard to believe, I think. But but some people haven't talked yet. Any 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 thoughts on the story just in general? Uh, did you like it? Did you think it you know was a home story or not? But what were your thoughts, Charlene? I think at one time. Uh... Arthur Cohen Doyle was trying to get a, a little bit away from Sherlock. He was trying to explore to see if he could write stories that people would like just because he was a good writer. And this might have been one of his veering off stories. I mean, close, he used a lot of the elements, but he didn't specifically say it was Sherlock and Watson because he was talented and he wanted to make sure that people liked the stories because he was a good writer and not just because of the two characters. So <clears throat> this would be a way to like step to the left just to see if they liked his stories, not just to sell his characters. And <clears throat> so, you know, keeping one foot in and one foot out. It, 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 and Morley did call <laughs> them suppressed stories. He called them suppressed Sherlock Holmes stories. So maybe that was Doyle's way of suppressing Sherlock Holmes's place in them. Larry, I, I have one problem. The distance between Liverpool and Manchester, the first stop, is about 35 miles. Mm -hmm. We don't know how far along this mine was. Let's say it's halfway or two thirds. Mm -hmm. And all the way along there were collieries, which means there's a labyrinth of tunnels underground. Mm -hmm. And the miners, even when they're not down there, live in those little colliery townships. And they're very, they're, their hearing is very attuned to explosions. I can't imagine an explosion that loud would not have been sensed or heard. Hmm. Okay, that could be. I, uh, again, I don't know. It's hard to know what, what would be what's practical in, in this kind of a thing. But uh, hmm. all right. So, as I said, you're not the only person that has some doubts about the solution. Of well, no, I enjoyed the story. I really did. Right. And also, they're, as they're racing, towards the mine and they're both hanging out of the side the two passengers are hanging out of the window <laughs> on a side lining like that they wouldn't be going very fast why didn't they just jump out even if they break their legs i mean they'd survive well, you would you would think so yeah he kind of depicted them kind of frozen in place and looking at the horror of it and uh, and he did before what happened was before they dropped out it did. It did say that before um, the the um, you know the Stoker and the, the three guys in, in in the front of the train before when they two of them were, were actually bought off and and they slowed the train down and then jumped and then set it to as fast as the train could go and then jumped out before it actually got faster. I think is the way. And but those so, yeah. trains didn't go very fast back then. Didn't go what? Those trains wouldn't have gone very fast on a side track. Yeah, I don't know. I want to let a couple more people jump in. Brian, then Ron, then I think Shane also wanted to jump in there. Okay. I'll be fast here, but just to stir the pot some more. Uh, my copy of the story is in uh, this edition. 
Oh, uh, okay. It's a really nice, it's a Reader's Digest actually, but it has uh, in addition it says the Further Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, and it includes this story, watches, and how Watson learned the trick. It just it does not say they're apocrypha. It says they're Sherlock Holmes stories. Okay, interesting. After listen to this, the afterword by Philip A. Schreffler, longtime BSA, BSI member from 1985 to 1992. He was sure. the editor of the Baker Street Journal. He held the prestigious Two Schilling Award, the BSI's highest honor. And he specifically says, the story of the man with the watches and the story of the lost special are Holmes mysteries that do not name Sherlock Holmes as the detective, period. That Holmes, then later on, he says that Holmes fails to solve these cases was Doyle's way of poking gentle fun at his detective, who in the 60 mainstream adventures virtually never makes an error and is almost a logical Superman. In a way, it's comforting to know that Holmes is human, that even the loftiest of brains can have an off day. Okay. Well, that is, that is, that, that is interesting. I'd never, I'd never seen that before. The, uh, the further adventures. Very no, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, yeah. Ron, did you want to say something? Here, I'll. I, I, Ron, I, you're I, on mute still, buddy. Unmute yourself. Let's see if I. Do you know how to unmute? He's, Ron? Got, to unmute, he's got to unmute himself. Yeah. Can you do it, Ron? In the upper right hand corner? There's a button, Ron, that says. Uh, hmm. there. It's mute. It says I think you can do it now. There it is. Oh, there you go. You're good, Ron. Actually, I didn't really want to say anything. I I'm just enjoying the conversation. <laughs> and Larry got the point I had yeah. about uh, that I thought it wasn't a Sherlock Holmes story because Holmes would have done more investigation on it to make sure what was going on. But yeah. thank you, guys. This is a great, great conversation and very enjoyable. I'm done. It was <laughs> You know, there was there were other scholars that said that Holmes would have got gotten out there personally, wouldn't have would have made it wouldn't have made any deductions without without the raw data, you know, and would have would have gone out to, to look at it personally. It's more like Mycroft to have done it just from from the armchair. But like you said, Derek, he didn't guarantee the the solution. All right, Shana, you want to jump on in? Yeah, discussing like the fate of the train and the speed of I mean. Conan Doyle was not one to let kind of the natural laws get in the way of a good climax of a story. Right. So mm -hmm. I think we're meant to assume that, you know, they, they managed to like, you know, before the, the conspirators jumped off the train, they like, you know, cranked it to go as fast as possible. So it would have been going at a really big, it was going fast enough that one of the gang observing the imminent crash was like, maybe it'll be able to jump the gap. So I guess we're meant to believe that it's going really fast, probably unrealistically fast. Like this is Hollywood physics, basically. Yeah. Out of control, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But and I, I really I found it interesting that you know this story is primarily told from the criminal's point of view for one. So we actually get the background, we get details like, oh, this one guy screwed up and wrote to his wife. So we right. had to deal with him. So yeah, and I it was kind of, I felt like the story was being told to me by like the evil Hercule Poirot because he, this guy kept going on about like, I am so good. You people don't even know. Let me explain to you just how genius I am. Yeah, I, I was thinking of Arsene Lupin. I thought that he was yes. a lot like, yes. he really reminded me of Arsene Lupin, the, uh, this, this Hernac guy, the Hernac guy, mm -hmm. Herbert de Lernac. Okay. All right, any last comment before we wrap up? Because we are, uh, we've, we've taken another hour of your time, my friends. Uh, any, any last words? Yeah, this is Tom. Has anyone seen my chats? I'm having. Yes, yeah, your chats are in there. We've seen them. A hard time. It's I good my time. stuff in the chat. Yeah, I had some trouble too yep. with that in the, in the beginning. I was going to ask, uh, I was, I, was, I wanted to, I, was, I couldn't, uh, it says everyone. But I, it does, and then it says, Derek, I can't like do a side chat in, the, in this version to, to, to Michael and Lee like I wanted to. That's, and that's only because I, didn't, I did not make you co-host, Larry. I didn't, oh, I didn't I even think of that. So sorry about that. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, 
But thank you guys. I'm cutting in and out so bad. I don't think I could explain my opinions. I, I, yeah. uh, did you want to say something quick, Tom? Uh, I think Holmes found it and didn't tell him. I told him not to. Okay. All right. I could, okay. I could see that as a possibility. Um, so I just want to let you guys know. Uh, so next month, we're going to go back uh, to the canon. Uh, and uh, Steve Mason is going to do uh, Six Napoleons. Did you want to say anything about uh, what do you want us to look for, Steve, in that one? Um, or do you just want us to read it? Well, just read it for right now. OK. So any reason Thank why you good. chose that one? I've just always liked that story. All right, and it's it's a good one. All right, excellent. Um, well, again, guys, happy New Year. This was an excellent uh, talk. Thank you, Larry. Uh, uh, round of applause for Larry for leading the discussion on the apocrypha. Yeah. And uh, and I look forward to seeing everybody uh, in February. Um, yeah, in February. So can't I don't remember the exact date is, but of course, first Saturday of mm -hmm. the month. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank take you. care, everybody. And All right. then, bye. bye. bye.